pastor, Akila Pastor, has uh, called the normal lectures an outdoor. And I like the expression, so I think we will use it for this evening. This evening, the academy is outdoor. Professor David Reggie, who is a professor of tropical, clinical, and oncology and medicine and therapeutics at the University of Ghana School of Medical Medicine and Dentistry. The immediate past rector of the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons is also a former director of the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research and the Center for Tropical Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics of the University of Ghana. Professor David Faraji has wide experience, has worked in the UK where he finished his initial training and became a member of the Royal College of Physicians of the United Kingdom. He has worked in Stockholm, Sweden. He has worked in the United States of America has been very actively involved in research and treatment of malaria, has worked extensively for the World Health Organization. So you can uh, agree with me, ladies and gentlemen, that this evening, this outdoor, a very happy uh, event of a truly capable fellow of the academy. To support him, I understand that his immediate family uh, are here, at least some of them. It's uh, Dr. Eugene of Raji here with us, and his son, Dr. Yao. And we see you please uh, acknowledge you. Thank you very much. We also the provost of the College of Health Sciences, also here, Professor Tate. Now, this is also uh, interesting because our speaker is the president of Mobile 67, and that's a very big uh, position uh, in Ghana and certainly within the Methodist Church. So, I need to go from my uh, fans, people, boys, mobile, are we here? All right. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, then I turn you over to Professor David Foreji to speak to us about medicines and healthcare in Ghana. I, I noticed that this is a digestible but it is done from on the ground. So why not call to drop the ground? <laughs> but it's very good. I'm chairman. And I'd like to thank you for the introduction. And also recognize the presence of the vice president of the health section. The honorary secretary who did the first speaking. You distinguished ladies and gentlemen and all the fellows of the academy. I think if the chairman did not say, I might as well clear my own records of trans by saying that I was elected a fellow of the college in 2009. But it was a long queue in front of me, so now it is my turn to do this. And this lecture is. Uh, All right, I, I'll go on when you fix it. This lecture is a component of my experiences in pharmaceutical management. Okay, thank you. Uh, within the healthcare delivery theater, especially in Ghana, and it relates to experiences from sitting on international committees, involvement with the Ghana Ministry of Health. Ghana Health Service, um, academic research, and personal interaction with the healthcare system in Ghana. At the national level, I have to declare my interest so that uh, 
there is no conflict. At the national level, we have been involved in the selection of essential medicines and the development of treatment guidelines for prescribers from about 1986 to 2008. With the development of the first medicines based on prices for the National Health Insurance Scheme. The involvement with drug regulation since 1987, when we moved from the Food and Drugs Board to the Land of Food and Drugs Authority, and activities related to improving the use of medicines, including herbal medicines. We did the first list of herbal medicines to be used in public health facilities and also for possible payment by the National Health Insurance Authority. At the international level, my involvement has been with UNICEF at the time we were doing the Bama Co Initiative, the World Health Organization, and selection of the model list of essential medicines, promoting rational use of drugs, patient safety, antimicrobial resistance, and adverse drug reaction reports. And just in all this, because I'll say something about some of these as we go along. I've also had the privilege of working with Management Sciences for Health in Arlington in the U.S. in their Rational Pharmaceutical Management Program. Working with the World Health Organization and the Rational Pharmaceutical Management Program meant traveling around Africa, organizing courses on the rational use of medicine and the setting up of drugs and therapeutics committees for health facilities and also health facilities drug management procedures. Academically, I have been involved in the teaching of clinical pharmacology and therapeutics at the, at the graduate and postgraduate level. And I have as one of my research interests an area in clinical pharmacology called pharmacoepidemiology. We are slightly different from the former epidemiologists. At this point, Chairman, Chairman, sorry. I'd like to recognize a couple of people who have sort of pushed me or helped me in this direction. The first is for some kind of Yukon Garden, who invited me in 1982 to join him to set up the Center for Tropical Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics. And I was there from 1985 until 1999 when I had to leave for the group as the director of that institution. This is a very interesting story, but I think it will place me in the right position. One morning in 1986, I was leaving for a meeting at the invitation of UNICEF and representing the Department of Medicine. And a gentleman, I recall, saw me at the corridor, introduced himself to me as Dr. Mutisa. And that he had come to invite me to the same meeting. I remember the presentation that took place in the corridor, in the corridor that day. We went to the meeting together, came in. in the room, he asked me to sit next to him. And I did. Before the end of the meeting, I have been given the responsibility of drawing up the essential business list. And since then, I have been at it. There were others in the Ministry of Health who made it easy for someone like me to survive in all the policies that we threw around. The late Dr. Samadji was one to this person like that. And there was also Dr. Samadji and Dr. Azubit Morgan. Now, for you to be able to do this kind of work, you sometimes need people to be around you and to deal with you in the trenches. And Chairman, I would like to mention <coughs> the name of Dr. Daniel Bugan who was the first research assistant I had when we were doing the Bamako Initiative Project. And has remained with me until now. He is a senior research fellow at the Bridge. <clears throat> the next person, now I can't call him this anymore, which is Professor Ahmad Gafriyans, who was also with us. And the last person I'd like to mention is Dr. Harry Mitchell who worked with us to move ideas from research into practice. And she did most of the field testing of all the things that we wanted to do. And I'd like to thank them all for their contribution. Even after this day, I'm so proud of their own achievements. 
The premise for this lecture is that since the early 1980s, the country has seen a series of interventions to address the issue of rational use of medicines and access to these medicines. That should be of good quality, quality, efficacious, available at all times, affordable within the reach of those who need them. In this lecture, we will look at some of the progress made and some challenges in this lecture. Quickly, the lecture will cover some of these areas. Uh, don't forget that it's that impression exactly. The first question we need to answer is where do our medicines come from? Most of the time, it is when you go to buy the medicine that we see. But there's a long history behind it. Sometimes it's not as we need it. The, kind of the medicines come through a process we refer to as drug discovery and drug development. Drug discovery is when you are looking for it. And when you find one potential molecule, this is a need, then you work on the need. When you push it forward through drug development, where you do all the animal studies, all the clinical trials, and eventually you have to register, send the drug for approval for registration. I think it is important in the light of recent history that we accept that clinical trials have been and will forever be with us. For as long as we need medicines, new ones as well as old ones, existing ones that we need to use for different indications. Now, there are certain things about drug development that I just want to draw your attention that there's the matter of the patent. When I find a molecule that is promising, I patent it. And usually the patent life is about 20 years. So I have to make sure that I have the product on the market with enough time left to recoup my investment. There are also other uh, matters that one has to go by. That the molecule should have an international non deprived union. There's a WHO body that does that. It gives it a unique thing, so irrespective of whether you are in Azerbaijan or you are in the Latin of the South Pacific Island, you mentioned that name, everybody knows that as the medicine. And then you need for you to be able to sell the medicine in any country, you need to get a market authorization. In this country, the body responsible for this is the Food and Drugs Authority. The most of the manufacturers we also would like to have a unique code to their product. And this is done by a body that I'm affiliated with, the WHO Working Group on Drug Use Statistics Methodology. And what we do is that we assign unique codes to these medicines as the manufacturers apply to them. There is also a European group that has to say, and our system is just about which you. Now, once you have the product on the market, you have to keep watching out for side effects and we did the test of these four clinical trials and also uh, institute the necessary power to vigilance activities with it. Medicines are then naturally substances, either natural or synthetic, used to treat. That's the function of the medicine. We used to treat, prevent, alleviate, or diagnose diseases. On your own, Medicines can also cause disease, unwanted side effects, and even death. So the use of medicine should be guided by good judgment on the part of the prescriber and on the part of the consumer. Now, medicines that we have in this country come through a process. The medicine first has to be registered by the Food and Drugs Authority. If the medicine is not registered by the Food and Drugs Authority, you cannot use it in this country. It's illegal. Once the medicine is registered, then we can use it for our things. And what then the public sector does is out of these medicines that are registered, you should take some and reduce them to do the standard treatment guideline. And out of the standard treatment guideline, you do the essential medicines list. The essential medicines list becomes the shopping list for the, the public sector. And usually, you would 
also had program, program drugs and drugs for public health issues that normally would not be prescribed as a interaction between a doctor and a patient in a clinical form. And out of the list, the National Health Insurance also derives its own list slightly wider than the essential um, medicine list. Now, there are four classes of medicines uh, within the laws of this country. There's a class A drug, which is where it's called a prescription only medicine. You can only purchase that medicine with a prescription from a certified medical practitioner or health practitioner. Then the class B drugs are medicines that when you walk into a pharmacy shop, the pharmacist will actually give to you the data prescription. The class C drugs are the medicines that we all call the over the counter medicines, the OTCs. And there's a special group of medicines that you normally not find in the shop, you find them in the hospital because of the addictive nature of some of the substances. And they are called controlled substances. And they are, their use in clinical practice is controlled. The medicine use system we have in this country therefore comprises the medicines, supply chain, the health providers, and the community. Three groups integrated. And the active players are the manufacturers, the suppliers, and the health providers, and the same individual. Now, the procurement of medicines in the public sector is done through the procurement and supply division of the Ministry of Health from international or local manufacturers directly or through agents according to existing law. Remember that we have a procurement law and we have to go by the procurement law. The sources of funding for medicines and vaccines in this country come from government central budget, generally generated funds, the various facilities, and support from a group of individuals who use the call donors, the number of donor and different publications, so we call them development partners. And global initiatives like the Global Alliance for Vaccine Initiative, Cardinal and the Global Fund for HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. The National Health Insurance Authority has increasingly taken over part of the government funding of medicine. The IG of the intended generated funds available goes mainly into essential medicines and consumables, whilst the government of Ghana development partners support those into public health uh, matters. There have been marked inefficiencies in resource utilization in procurement of medicines. The country procures medicines mainly from the international market, and it's not always that you get a very good bargain. Local manufacture of medicines, especially those of the essential medicines list, has improved over time, but still not a significant portion. Market. The fragmented procedure of pharmaceuticals, procurement of pharmaceuticals, the various service providers and the regional district levels have also resulted in the loss of advantage in economies of scale from bulk procurement. Presently, a supply chain master plan has been drafted, which, when approved and implemented, will bring order to the supply chain system. The country does not meet the criteria for government support for the vaccines that we get for immunization anymore because we have become a lower, a lower, a lower, a lower income country. Our status has changed. And therefore, they are actually graduating us from their support. And the graduation ceremony will be in 2019. And this has marked implications. The government budget allocation for supply of medicines. The situation will get worse should the rural firm also decide to pass it out as having graduated. For the country graduation, the financial implications, even during the transition period between 2015 and 2019, will seriously affect the immunization program and the cost of new vaccines, threatening the sustainability of this very important health provision if we do not get sources of support from our resources. I'll shift my attention now to what it means by health care. 
have the oh, this is just to make you sort of start wondering what it is. I'll tell you what it is very soon. Healthcare, on the other hand, is defined as the maintaining and restoring of health by the treatment and prevention of diseases, especially by trained and licensed professionals. In our context, we also have to add traditional units, especially parents. But tonight, I cannot talk about parents. This in 2010, there about were the various routes by which we got medicines in this country. The final destination is the Central America. So the, 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 just about the pen. So all these things eventually end up there. That's the various sources of medicine from what we are getting medicine. Now, the functioning, the functioning health system. A well functioning health system responds in a balanced way to a population's needs and expectations by improving the health status of individuals, families, and communities, by defending the population against what threatens its health, and protecting people against the financial consequences of ill health, and by providing equitable access to people's health care, making it possible for people to participate in decisions affecting their own health and the health of the system. Without strong policies and leadership, health systems do not spontaneously provide balanced responses to these challenges, nor do they make most efficient use of their resources. I'm referring to the future population. Now, the, wealth, the, the, the healthcare system, the essential component, are an example of the health workforce, health services, health finance, governance and leadership, health products and technologies, and above all, a very good health information system. According to the 2014 holistic assessment of the health sector, the doctor to population ratio improved slightly from 1 doctor to 10,170 persons in 2013. To one doctor, 9,043. So we are not out of the here. There are similar improvements in this indicator for other health professionals. The number of other health professionals and support staff make up the health force in the health sector. It is important to bear in this time. A satisfied and happy health workforce is essential for a well functioning health sector. Health services in this country are provided by the Ghana Health Service, the teaching hospitals. Christian Health Association of Ghana, quasi government institutions, and private institutions. Health finance is financed mainly by government, employers, health partners, the out of pocket expenditure of patients or relatives. The National Health Insurance Scheme is a major financing mechanism for health, and private insurance companies are gradually gaining ground. I think one of the key things about health. System is its governance and leadership. The national institution responsible for health of citizens in this country is the Ministry of Health. There are other ministries, but the primary one is the Ministry of Health. And it is the policy making body, it makes only policy. Then its agents implement the policy. The Minister of Health heads the ministry. If you will recall, this is one of the most fluid positions in this country. I tried to get the public relations man to give me a list of ministers of health we have had since 1980. I think we're still struggling to find some of the answers. The agencies of the Ministry of Health then implement these policies, as I said. And in carrying out this mandate, the ministry works with these people. And the Ghana Health Service, the Mental Health Authority, the ambulance service, blood transfusion service, allied health service, traditional medicine, and even the training institutions like the new colleges that are being set up are all agencies of the Ministry of Health and implement these policies. The development partners comprise the new agencies involved in health, the bilaterals, 
by the Global Health Initiatives. There is a proven mechanism in place for managing the complex interrelationships between all these rather very powerful bodies who have you know, like says in our affairs. The medical products we talk about are the medicines, the vaccines, and health devices. And the health of the nation system uh, is an attempt to move us away from the paper based transactions that we have done with records since colonial times. And uh, still exist in many health facilities. But I can assure you that the Ghana Health Service is taking key health very seriously. And there are lots of uh, enterprise uh, architecture work being done to make sure that uh, everything is done electronically. Actually, the University of Ghana Hospital, which we all call Lincoln Hospital, I understand has own papers. It's probably the first one I have heard of in this country. And I think all health institutions should look at that because of their inherent advantages in having such a facility available in the day to day management of the health facility and also in looking after patients. Normally, when people ask, they have several choices to choose from. They either go for biomedical management, they go for spiritual management, or they hunt for a spiritualist or a herbalist or a doctor, depending on how they feel or how treatment with one has fared. So, if you go to a doctor, it doesn't get you, well. you go to a spiritualist and translate to the herbalist. They go to a herbalist and he's dying, they bring him to the hospital. And there are some people who don't do anything about yeah, health status. Now, the several studies have been done in this country looking at our health system behavior, both for acute and for chronic health problems. Now, according to the Ghana Medical Standards Service, six weeks of time in 2011, nearly half of persons who fell ill attended the hospital for about 46, 47 years. About a quarter saw a chemical cell. They've changed their name. They are now called over the counter medicine cells. That's the modern name, like the front desk executive. 20% about a fifth of them went to clinics, and only 6% actually went to the pharmacy. However, when you look at the results for the 2008, Ghana Legal Standards Center. They used different uh, variables. And it's still the same, you can, you, can, you can determine that instead of using practitioners, they use facilities. But you can see, still see the, the dominance of the chemical center as a point of reference for certain individuals in this country. And I know in the past they have been having attempts to upgrade the the standard of practice of chemical cells, although they are very limited in the kinds of medicines that they can sell. But one of the most impressive medicine warehouses I've seen was in Ronga Afrika, in Sudan. A seven sided chemical cell is stolen and it was big. The data also in this health system behavior said that urban areas differ from rural areas in. In the way they look for help. Whilst about 79 percent of the sick and injured in Accra consult doctors, only about 47 in other urban settings do so. And, uh, uh, and among the rural communities, the proportion ranges from 40 percent in the rural coastal to 20 percent in the rural suburban. So, although these figures are averages, when you actually look into details, you find differences. The change in the focus of the variables from practitioner to health facility poses a challenge, but as I've said, we can still read the importance of this level. When you look at the demographic health survey, the 2014 report, the 2014 demographic health survey, it also indicates that 37% of women and 15% of men sought health within the six months we call period. There is a very interesting phenomenon we are seeing very often. Ladies tend to go to hospital more often 
than men. I don't know whether that's why, in general, they tend to survive their men. There's a big study we're doing with over 3,000 participants. And the women have numbered the men as it. And I think the social scientists are more that should find an explanation for this so that the men will catch up. The GSS survey also shows that services provided were, were paid for by the National Health Insurance in 61% of the females and 50% of the women. The remainder paid cash. 80% or more of the respondents were satisfied with the service they obtained in terms of the location of the health facility, ease of getting the option for treatment, and the interaction with the providers. But about 30% of them were not satisfied with the waiting time. We have enough chemical centers scattered around the country, especially in the private areas, for us to be able to use them more effectively than we are doing now. There has been a global concern about the use of medicines in clinical practice. Heads of states of developing countries, especially, express their concern to the world of the same, resulting in the nation initiating action to address the problems related to the use of medicines. WHO itself estimates that more than half of all medicines are prescribed, dispensed, and sold inappropriately, and that half of all patients fail to take them correctly. Overuse, underuse, misuse of medicines results in wasted or scarce resources and widespread for health hazards. Examples of irrational use of medicines include use of too many medicines for patients, inappropriate use of antibiotics or antimicrobials, inadequate usage, now and sometimes it's not only the doctor's fault but the patient's fault, giving antibacterials for non bacterial infections. Overuse of injections when oral formulation will be more appropriate. And sometimes we want to misunderstand our patients. There was a study in Georgia Carta where all the children were getting injections for upper respiratory tract infection. And when it was screened, it was discovered that the mothers actually came for the serum. But they allowed their children to receive the injections because they thought the doctors were getting the injection. And there's a lot of the social, cultural aspects of drug use that exist. And I think uh, anthropologists and social scientists have a lot of work to do with this for that. The drug nature of definition of use of medicines requires that patients receive medications appropriate to their clinical needs. The doses that meet their own individual requirement for an adequate period of time and at the lowest cost to them and their community. The importance of medicine is reflected in the Millennium Development Codes, just passed in Millennium Development Code 8, and especially Target 8E, that says that in cooperation with the pharmaceutical companies, provide access to affordable and central drugs in developing countries. Unfortunately, the 2015 report on the Millennium Development Code is quite silent on this time. The best measure available indicates that from 2007 to 2014, on average, generic medicines were available in 58% of public health facilities, low income and lower middle income countries. However, in Ghana, the estimate of the basket of medicines on the essential medicine list showed an availability of 85.7% between 2010 and 2014, although the 2014 figure was slightly less than the 2010 figure. There are now several initiatives by the major pharmaceutical companies to address this matter. This has become also as the bed of non communicable diseases and the persistence of infectious diseases and the problem of neglected tropical diseases. Become more popular. There is actually a private foundation called the Access to Medicines Foundation, and it has an index that uses to measure the performance of big farm in contributing to addressing this problem. We are currently involved in one of such activities 
that is looking at differential pricing. There are different prices for different people. Of medicines for hypertension and diabetes. And the effect this will have on control of the disease and also on disease outcomes. And this is being done in Ghana, which is being done in the Chia Hospital, Comparative Teaching Hospital, and the Hospital, Tabarin Teaching Hospital, and King's Medical Center. So it's spread all over the place so that we get a good picture of how this mechanism of making medicines available at reasonable cost will affect control and outcome. With September 2015, came the end of the Millennium Development Growth, which was officially replaced by the Sustainable Development Growth. The new Sustainable Development Growth and the broader sustainability agenda go much further than the Millennium Development Growth, addressing the root causes of poverty and the universal need for development that works for all people. Goal three of the Sustainable Development Growth states ensure healthy lives and promote well-being all at all ages. While persons have a role to play in most of the targets, targets 3.8, 3B to G, relates specifically to persons. Lessons available for use in this country are allopathic medicine, in other words, they are pills, injections, and suppositories sometimes. I also have a medicine, another chapter I put in here. The, meds, the country has a medicine policy that was first published in 2004 and recently reviewed. I think they are looking for money to print it if they haven't found it already. The policy recognizes allopathic and herbal medicine. While the majority aim of the major aim of the document has not changed, this scope has broadened to include aspects of health technology assessment. As one of the tools to use in making decisions for what we do with medicines in this country. So, we are wanting to have medicines come into this country, and how the Food and Drugs Authority has the requisite legal body to do what it does. I say a little bit about brand medicine and generic medicine. Because generally, we have the perception that generic medicines are inferior to branded products and that uh, when we go to doctor people would like to get a branded product rather than a generic person if you can afford it or as the doctor said to a patient of now if you have children uh, abroad you should be able to send them money to buy a branded one which is totally irresponsible so Allopathic medicine are either branded or sometimes we call them the major products or the generic products. And the generic product is you have to make a distinction between a generic name and a generic product. A generic name is always equivalent to the international non proprietary name. But a generic product is a product that derives from the same one whose patent in a specificity period. As it's high. So, everybody with a manufacturing plant, the capacity to get the active pharmaceutical ingredient, can make it. And of course, sometimes it's not used everywhere, and therefore we run into problems with the quality. But with time, most countries can now set up systems to make sure that the generics that they make available to their citizens are the same quality as the branded. In fact, in Britain and the USA now, generic medicines are used more than branded products. And there's a way of negotiating and getting this done. For us in Ghana, just as the FDA, yeah, we, are, we are also FDA by nature. In the US, you need to produce a bioequivalence certificate before your generic product will be registered. The bioequivalent certificate simply that you have demonstrated that your generic medicine has the same characteristics as the innovator medicine. And I think our food and growth world is doing very well in that regard. 
There is an attempt to set up a bioequivalence lab in this country. And I think some work has gone to it, but I could not find where the paper, paper work is at this particular time. In recent times, unfortunately, some companies, small companies, are beginning to play tricks with generic medicine. You remember the Sunday Sunday medicine we used to take? And the one we give to pregnant women. It became a very important medicine in the prophylaxis of patients with HIV AIDS. And the company bought the marketing authorization. And overnight increased the price of that medicine, which is generic medicine, plus 600 percent and of course, there was a big outrage, and we finally dropped the, the high price. But there are other companies doing the same with some of the essential medicines of the WHO list of essential which are very important to us, which are generic. But in the US, because the diseases are rare, the market there is different. But when they buy the marketing authorization, it's the only source that you can get the medicine. So generic risk are also facing a threat. The prescription, dispensing, and use of medicines are part of what we say the consultation cycle in the health care. Normally, it is the last phase. The choice of medicine to deal with an individual's health problem must be tailored to that particular individual's Indeed, individualized is increasingly becoming an option to follow. This has become more prominent since the sequencing of the human gene and all the genomic evolutions followed. The choice of therapeutic intervention is expected to be based on evidence. And evidence-based medicine has become thematic. And there are several approaches to it for However, in recent times, there have been concern about how some of the evidence to rely on is generated. Some of the concerns involve methodological issues, inability to interpret publications, and undue influence by interested parties to shift conclusions of systematic reviews and other side things. In our setting, it is important as a first step to introduce undergraduates, and especially postgraduate students in the medical field, the skills required to read and understand the scientific article. Is basic. If we don't do that, we will end up having our young doctors prescribing medicines on the basis of any authors' conclusions. Not who prescribes medicine. The people authorized to prescribe medicine are doctors and dentists in this country. However, with the scheme of things, other health professionals are also authorized to practice medicine, to, to prescribe medicine. And it is very important that we recognize that for you to prescribe medicine. You must belong to a professional association you must be registered and a good stand. If you don't, then you are caught and get into trouble with your own power. Now, pharmacies also dispense the three classes of medicine. And they are also allowed, as I said earlier, to dispense certain classes of medicine without necessarily having a doctor's prescription. But again, they have to work within the law. The national drug policy states very clearly that Prescribing of medicine shall be in accordance with the Public Health Act 2012, Act 851, and the Health Professions Regulatory Bodies Act 2013, Act 857. It's very clear. Prescribing of medicine shall only be by duly registered practitioners who are in good standing with the appropriate regulatory body. Professional regulatory bodies shall ensure that prescribers adhere to the principles of the prescribing practice. In the Ministry of Health, shall develop a standard prescribing form that gives adequate information on patient, disease condition, the medicines, and the prescribing details in the products with the animals. And all medicines shall be prescribed by the generic or international non-proprietary. 
Prescribing of medicines shall be guided by the standard treatment guidelines of the country and the essential medicine series. Now we are all going to hospital for it. We have all received prescriptions. Um, this is not my favorite prescription. I'm the worst one, but I think I need to be nice to my colleagues. Um, if you can read it, good luck, but I think the pharmacist was able to read it, so that we should go to the the key challenges we face in this country is that we prescribe too many medicines. We expose our patients on necessary antibiotics. We give them too many injections. And we guide the medicines that are not on the essential medicines list. And in our practice, we don't have copies of the standard treatment guidelines. There are other ways of looking at this problem. But our preliminary investigations show that there's a lot of problems, there are lots of problems in the practice of medicine in as far as prescription of medicine is concerned. And I'll show you this carefully. And I'll later on tell you what we did when we went to this village. His name is Voltaire. He lives on the other side of the country, but this is it. I'm going to start this week to teach you this. Before the palace office. Okay, so. Voltaire is a bit, for those of you who go to Riva, but it's on the other side of the border, just close to the airport. Fairly, that food is fairly major. And he said that doctors are men. He said, he said men. We just have to be in front of it. Doctors are men who, who prescribe medicines of which we know little, to get diseases of which we know less, human beings of whom we know nothing. <laughs> he said this in the human right now, but I think this is a challenge for every doctor to prove this matter. So, can we actually measure drug use? Because if you can measure it, then you can improve it. Because you have the tool for looking at where you are and where you are. When the WHO published the first series of essential medicines as a response to the request by heads of states, especially from developing countries, they dealt with the definition of the rational use of medicine, which I have shown you. In 1989, the International Network for the Rational Use of Drugs was established. began as one of the first countries, actually, to become a member of that network. And we worked very hard, and we came up with a set of indicators which looked so good that the page would come it. And I was polite enough to say to call it the WHO Input Indicators for Studying in Drug Use. And up to now, if you look at the citation of that publication, it has said it was published only yesterday. People are still using that data. And it gives you indicators to cover prescribing, patient care indicators, like how long the patient spends in the consulting room, how long he spends, he spends at the pharmacy window being given instructions to uh, how to take his medicine. And in Nigeria, we found that we couldn't measure this in minutes, so we had to measure it in seconds, because it took eight seconds for the transaction to be completed, when the man has five minutes. That one. And there are also facility indicators that the study. Now, several studies have been conducted in Ghana, and uh, I'll show you some of the results and the trend. But if we were to be taken to the halt of rational use of medicine, our charge would look like this. Oops, this is not right. Our charge would look like this. Now we're exposing our patients to make medicines, we are exposing them to injections, and that would be our charge. Now, what have we done about this? As I said, um, we first need to understand the problem we 
reports from the units. So when you use less heating appropriately, you reduce the quality of therapy. You waste resources. You put your patient at risk of having a long-term effects. You also have psychological impact on the patient because it's not getting better. And it's beginning to wonder whether this is mother in law who's doing this or it's the grandmother can have something in the Anyway, so we have done a couple of uh, studies, and some of these are some of the uh, factors that influence doctors to prescribe inappropriate. Uh, it includes on the patients the general misconception of their misleading health beliefs. For the prescribers, they are plenty. Uh, knowledge is one of them, self interest is another one. And the doctors who have their medicines are sitting on their desk in their clinic. So when they write a prescription, they take from the container and give it to you. I think NHIA is making it less attractive. But before they did, they did that, so they were actually branding the business along with another business. For the industry, there's a lot of promotion going on. I'm yet to come across a drug rep who says that the one I just source medicine is better than this. Every time, yes, it's better than the last one. And Unfortunately, they also are very savvy with their interaction techniques. In fact, at one time, we were thinking about using their face to face encounter as a means of changing doctors' prescribing habits. But somehow, they managed to get us to change our prescription. I don't see how a doctor will come to me and say that, oh, as for my product, it doesn't cause a great type of dysfunction. When it belongs to the same chemical group as three other products, which everybody is safe. But a good friend, doctor of mine, who takes a start prescribing his meds. The other large group of people that uh, also have an effect in the way they prescribe meds is the, the doctor of license. Where the medicines are there, they are not there. So if the medicines are not there, they will prescribe another one. So we have done a lot of things, and there are several, in fact, several opportunities to improve these things. One of them is an educational intervention, and the other one is an anterior intervention, and the other one is a regulatory intervention. Irrespective of which one you use. If you use them on their own, usually you don't get good results. You have to use them in combination. Or probably use all three at the same time in order to get the bite to see if that's same change. There has been several opportunities to make progress with some of these interventions. And <clears throat> several pharmaceutical sector scans have been done in this country. Then we had a project funded by different called the strategy, you know, the strategy is called by Russia from the city of the Meta. Actually, in trying to write out this, I have not seen a group, a multidisciplinary group, produce so many reports. I'm not saying this because I was a co-chair of the Meta. I'm no longer am, so I think you can just, you can look at what I say in that fact. But they have written Confusing about the health sector in this country. From all perspectives, I didn't really, really realize the enormity of the work we were doing until I started looking at everything that we have done in that area. So, when you collate the results of some of these things, you get an idea as to what we have been able to achieve. And some of the interventions that I've taken to it, I think the primary one. Is the establishment of the Ghana National Drugs Program. It's still there, and it it's actually the, the body that implements the national medicines policy. Then we have the, we did all these studies, the Grand Workshops of Rational Use of Drugs, which established drugs and therapeutic companies in both the uh, of the teaching hospitals now have drugs and therapeutic companies, and the regional hospitals. 
and the few days from now. We have a national uh, drug information resource center in Accra. It's very unfortunate because at the time that this was being considered, we were also looking at the possibility of setting up a poison center. And that was supposed to be like a set up a KMU waste in Mumbai. So the medicine one would be in Accra, and the Mumbai said we caused the school of violence here at that time. So they would help the poison in poison. <clears throat> then it was also during the time of the inception of the Ghana National Health Program that we started sending pharmacies for master's training in clinical farms until KMUS started with clinical farms. We have international employees to the uh, training. Now we look at some of the indicators that I said can be measured. We look at how we perform between 1993 and 2014. It is not for all the years that we have the data, but the good thing is that the Ministry of Health set the target, realizing that our charge sheet was horrible. So the target is the last column, the route to your left, to your right, so And you can see that for the number of drugs that we give to people when they come to your group, we have made gradual, consistent drop, and we are almost at the level of the target. If you look at antibiotics exposure to this, we have not made a dent. We will talk about that in detail. We are still way above the national target. If you look at injections, very impressive, consistently going down until we are not even below the target. And if you look at writing prescriptions in the editor, that's around. That is supposed to be 100%. We are driving in the last four or five years. Prescribing medicines of the essential medicines test, we are making progress. The amount of the chaser, the set of chaser medicines available at the and that is a basket of medicines that you expect to find when you go into the health center. We are doing well. We did well after 2013, and then we did a bit of a drop in 2014. But it's not bad. <clears throat> so now we have the medicine, but one of the major problems we have is how to access the medicine. And generally, there is a feeling that access to medicine is the English interpretation of access. So I have access to this microphone, so I take it. No. Access to medicine is a complex matter. And it's best studied using a range of indicators that provide data on availability of rights in both public and private centers in combination with key policy indicators. Now, I'm going back to Mr. Walter's village. I don't know whether it's a reason for holding the meeting there, but in 2000, a group of experts met up and concluded that access to essential medicines is a construct that encompasses distinct dimensions. And these are distinguished by sets of specific relationships and four dimensions of access with a cross-cutting issue was defined. And one of us at that meeting then put this in a very high drawing about availability uh, affordability, geographic access, and accessibility. And then we built the construct, we did a construction around it on top. We got all the determinants clearly applied. I'm supposed to find this at the screen, but it's not working. So this, this went on and on and on, so that all the determinants and things were defined. And that then became the structure within which we look at access. Okay. So these are the determinants of access. Physical availability, which defines the relationship between the type and quantity of product and the service needed type of quantity of product and service available. Affordability is defined by the relationship between the 
products and services and the user's ability to pay for them. Accessibility defined, defined by the relationship between the location of the product and service and the location of the eventual user of the product. You can see the indicators coming out. And acceptability or satisfaction is referring to the fit between users and providers and expectations and output. Quality of the product has a cost for these. So, on the basis of this, on the basis of uh, <clears throat> I was wrong about this. When the studies have been done, you can see that I've already mentioned the availability of key medicines. It's about 80 percent in public facilities. It's 93 percent by 20. These are 2010 figures. A very good indicator of availability is the percentage of medicines prescribed versus the percentage of medicines dispensed. And that, at the moment, in Ghana, stands at about 94%. This is at 2010. And then we we'll also look at the lowest paid public servants salary and how much of it we need to pay for the treatment of the child or to pay for the malaria or the particular condition. And these are some of the things that we have to look at. Now, it's very interesting that at this stage, I think we should talk a little bit about price build up because it's very good. Apart from the manufacturer's price, you have to pay, take into consideration the insurance and freight, which becomes CIA value of the drug, the cost insurance. Then the charges you pay when the medicine arrives at our port, they are then DAT, NHIA, and all those things. They're all added. When it gets to the OCA, the OCA has this. When it gets to the retailer, the retailer, the retailer has 25 vehicles in the hospital. The hospitals also look at the market. So by the time you are paying for the medicine, if you take the person that we've been using rather frequently now, the matter, the cumulative matter for septuagint, for example, in an era of private facility is 263% about the manufacturing price. If you look at, I did add that because we use the wrong, but if you look at prevention, which is used for diabetes, Again, all the percentages out of the two of them are about 300%. And if you look at the, the other one, which is used for hypertension, I'll say the third I was shocked when I found that it's about 2,000 percent higher than that. These are prices that we pay and they contribute to our inability to afford some of these things. I'll show you later that. that now, the other interesting thing about medicines in Ghana now, probably in other African countries, is the fact that we know that we use medicines to treat disease, to alleviate, to prevent, and also to diagnose. And I've been trying to work my head around this phenomenon we have in Ghana, where medicines have now become a source of funding for support of the health system. To the extent that the health manager can say, if we close down the pharmacy, I'll pack my bags and go because I cannot bring this food. And it is simply because the way we manage our pharmacies in a public health institution, the challenges we are facing with national health insurance and reinvestment has made this a means of survival. Although, remember, in the 1980s, when the revolving health funds were set up, and everybody was being harsh about it, we called it harsh and harsh. We did a very bad way to the good system, and we killed it. So, we have these problems, and then I'll just show you this one. That shows you that even in the Ministry of Health, it is good expenditures. IGM, it's about 57 cents 
of the resource they use for their expenditures. And this is from the 2014 holistic assessment to its findings. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the antibiotics. And uh, as I said, we have not been very successful in reducing the use of antibiotics. <clears throat> We use antibiotics essentially to shorten the duration of illness. In the olden days, if you had pneumonia, your doctor would dutifully listen to you every day. You have a fever, he's worried. On the 12th day, he comes, fever is broken, fever is broken, you are sweating, he smiles at you, and he says, You will survive. There were no antibiotics. Then penicillin came along, and then we started getting the better. We got more and more antibiotics. In theory, microorganisms have the ability to become resistant to antibiotics. In theory, it is only when we use antibiotics and exert due pressure on the bacteria, the germs, that they get the opportunity to resist the effect of the antibiotic and then become. Resistance. So we need to be very careful about how we use this. And there's no better place to look for this than at the highest center of learning in this so far in this country, the first one, quality teaching My own department, department of medicine. So we need to wind the antibiotics to see how antibiotics are used. In the, in the hospital, in the department. When I said this, my son yeah, then said, Oh, I did a similar study in 2012 for the infection control committee. I said, Fine. They used the same tool to look at 2016. And the way we use antibiotics and the other things are quite good. But I think the interesting thing for us is. The type of antibiotics we are looking, we are, we are, we are, we are using now. I just then remember that in 2000, I did a study also in the same department, looking at the treatment of pneumonia and the antibiotics we use in treating pneumonia. Because for the 2012 and the 2016 studies, the commonest condition we were looking at was pneumonia. And you will look, you will see that the antibiotics that we are using in 2000 are no longer, most of them are not really scaling. Chris French is gone, amoxicillin is gone, gentamicin is not there. In 2012, we had coamoxiclar, metronidazole, and the rest. In 2016, the positions have changed. Coramoxiclar that used to be on top is now number four. Metronidazole that was second in 24 is now number five. So we are switching. The more potent antibiotics are now being used more commonly than the ones we were using only four years ago. This warns us that if we are looking for trouble, we have got it. There are other studies done by Professor Newman, another one by uh, Dr. Opinion, they are both in the microbiome, that also supports the increasing resistance of isolates to antibiotics. Now, one of the things that we do not know about, about antibiotics, that we always look at them in the hospitals. We have never actually looked seriously the community's perspective on the use of antibiotics. And only the last week or two weeks ago, the, the WHO published a report on the community perception of the use of antibiotics. Antibiotic. And they found that some prescription of antibiotics, okay, as well as not purchasing them without uh, prescriptions or in a proper amount. And the the findings reveal that 65% of the respondents are taking antibiotics within six, six months of the survey. 
and persons in the lower income countries and young women who have were more likely to take antibiotics. The majority received their antibiotics from the health facility or was prescribed by the doctor or the nurse. The report emphasizes the need to educate the public about the use of antibiotics and the observance of personal hygiene practices. And I think in this country, some of us do not believe in the general theory of disease causation. And we should try very hard to bring this back. The first thing is handling. So currently, the landscape of antibiotic resistance set against the sensitivity of existing common bacteria as it gives us a great cause for this. In fact, the concern is so great that several years ago, the House of Lords commissioned a report on the antibiotic resistance. They have recently commissioned another one. September last year, President Obama issued an executive something about teaching doctors how to write the good prescriptions for antibiotics and educating doctors. We have set up a group to go seriously into antibiotics. Now, the problem is that, oh, and in this country also, in 2013, we set up an antibiotic resistance working group. We've done some good work. We've actually written an antibiotic policy, but again, it's hanging somewhere. But the thing is that, the number of new antibiotics in the development pipeline is small. So if we misuse what we have now, the time comes for us to require new ones. Antibiotics will probably be that we can't extend. We will be fine. Now let's say a little bit about national health insurance. National health insurance now pays for most of the jobs we take. National health insurance is still there. Registration numbers are going up astronomical. Utilization numbers are going up. Doctor Irene and then after pocket expenditure is going down. These are these are figures from the National Health Insurance Fund that she said, which he gave us at the this year's New Year School. So I didn't even know that. But Doctor Irene the Paul has done studies that also show an increasing use in outpatient insured as opposed to uninsured individuals. And the same pattern exists for inpatient. So obviously, utilization is going on. In fact, it's interesting if you look at the first one, that the number of people seeking an uh, application service per person per year is also, is also going on. For those who are insured. Okay. And she also looked at how we use this inside these facilities, which is not different from what we know from the general Now. The service medicine ratio of claims for the national insurance in this country since 2005 up to 2012 has consistently been around 50%. This is higher than other social insurance schemes in different parts of the world. This data has to be looked at with some caution, but the figures we have around, and these are two figures taken out of any GIA claims by Dr. Dupont. Clearly shows that we are spending more on medicines as compared to services. So, to summarize the activities, they are doing very well, and uh, but the majority of claims are for both the services. Medicine costs are doing. The challenge we have now is that instead of the starting to three months being invested in Nigeria, we are now doing more than six months. When everybody goes about it, and everybody is complaining, and life goes on. There's a technical review in process now, and I hope that we will have uh, some relief for what we are doing. The few suggestions to make they have a very good IT solution in place, and I think that. If they use it, it will be very helpful in offering on this advice to help day to day management of, 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 the, of the scheme. One of the things we did when we did the first medicines list for health insurance was actually to design a prescription form that will allow for the capture 
of all the necessary data. So far as I know, Colombo is the only hospital that has adopted that prescription for discovering the symptoms. Uh, I hope that this will be spread to other places. I think we need to be strengthen institutional and trust and the communities also so that we can be able to help in the management of nurses with the health facilities. And to so take a cue from one of the private insurance companies that organizes regular CMS courses for its providers. And it used to be a condition before the Medical and Dental Council made it mandatory for you to get credit before you are retained or register. If you did not attend a certain percentage of the CBDs that were involved, your continuation as a provider was at risk. So to wrap up, we have made great progress from when we started in 1980 in achieving the key elements of the national medicine. In fact, in the 2013 assessment of the national medicine policy, about 60% of the activity in there had actually been accomplished. We should finalize all those documents that we need to finalize, get things done. The supply chain master plan, anti biotic resistance policy, pricing policy. I forgot to add the biocurrent center so that we be able to do things properly. We should plan for the future. This is not a matter of education. We must sit. <clears throat> Looking into the future, you should remember that we have a demographic shift. People are getting older, and as we get older, the more diseases we tend to collect, and the more medicines that we have to take, national health insurance will have to factor this, especially when exemptions from the elderly taking. So you have the elderly who a lack of consumption of your medicines fail, and yet they are exempt from taking. Treatments, we should take that and we are going to have non communicable diseases increasing in the health. There is also an epidemiologic shift. We have new diseases, everybody is talking about well cap and sicker virus. They want to come, and they are likely to be zoonotic, and so we should be prepared for them and add them to the things that we want to do. The universal health policy, national health insurance. Is seen as the vehicle by which we can achieve universal health policy. Although I see that the new team prefers to use universal primary health care as opposed to universal health coverage. But calling it by any other, everybody must have access to health. And we should think about these things. And we've already spoken about the medicines and the portion that we do. One interesting thing that we haven't looked at. And I'm trying to look at it. It's the you know we we really invest for medicines, but I don't think we have an idea as to which medicines are costing us more. I just had access to the list of a hundred top medicines uh, for 2015 from the National Health Insurance. When I looked at it, I saw lots of missed opportunities for information that can be gleaned if one has access to that kind of data. And I think we should look at doing things like that. And also, uh, we should look at the management information system. At the New Year's School, the former chief executive showed us a lot of good plans that we're having for their IT platform and moving towards a particular situation. And I wish National Health Insurance Authority. A parting quote. Decisions about changes in health coverage, especially those intended to benefit the poor, are fundamentally about changing the application of resources in society, and therefore essentially about politics. This recognition underlines the importance of political commitment. In the new way and then political scale on the part of national leaders in order to make new progress and moving forward greater efficient in health systems as countries move towards universal health coverage. I'd like to thank my sponsors.
Trade Green, RICO, Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana, Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, but let me see in this nice auditorium of the years, assume for free. And the operating farm and how to make it very clear. It's that operating farm for my parents. Because when we started, we were new to operate, it's now that so we need to operate this year. Sometimes people ask me whether they are my daughters and sons. Then there are individuals whose contribution to the publication of, the, of this presentation I do not do that. Mr. Samuel Watkin, who used to be the head of procurement and the Ministry of Health. Mrs. Bruce, with whom I started the company came for our farmers who were several years ago, recording from those in the And Mrs. Martha Jackson, who is the chief pharmacist of the Ministry of Health. And thank you very well for making sure that everything I have tried to see today is being the fact and not my own. Finally, to the union, the children, the in-law, grandchildren, we kept wondering what I would do at the dining table for my computer. For their confidence, press, and love. Thank you all for being here. we have heard from a person who has been all over the Ghana Health Service in education, medical education, and he's telling us for first-hand experience. He's not reporting other people's work. So that's all very good. Um, we do know that for an inaugural uh, lecture, no questions are asked, no discussions take place inside the auditorium. And of course, I'm sure that Professor Ufredi will appreciate reviews, good ones, please, in the uh, press, electronic and print, also on the radio waves. Please, don't cast guys in too much. I call this an insider's story. And we thank Professor Fredi. Please join me to show appreciation.
information. And I thank you all for coming and have a pleasant evening.